Welcome. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, introduce Dr. Masoud Soleimani, Iranian stem cell scientist, who joins us. Uh, you have also experienced a similar ordeal in some sorts, which we will be getting into later. Welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Randy Short, civil rights activist, joins us from Washington, D.C. So I'd like to welcome you all, and uh, let me first start with you. First of all, it's, uh, it's great to uh, have this one-year anniversary come about and have uh, two guests with us, Dr. Soleimani and Randy Short, uh, to expand on this. And uh, my immediate question to you is, given the fact that one year has passed, what, uh, what are your thoughts on this day? Obviously, memories come back, the sure. impact it's had on your life, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I want to start off, actually, uh, Kave, just thanking everyone um, who uh, played a big part in my release, yourself, all of my uh, fellow co-workers at Press TV, all the activists all over, all, all over the world um, who really made a difference. And I know that they made a difference because I saw the reaction from the judge, from the lawyers. Um, the louder the noise became, uh, the more it was in the news, um, I saw the reaction. So it definitely made a difference. And I want to thank everyone and start right there. And my thoughts, actually, uh, first of all, uh, it, it's my honor to be here with Dr. Soleimani. And I'm very happy um, that he's back here and he's free. And I think what comes to mind, actually, are still so many people who are in jail um, over there. Uh, we're talking about Iranians, but also non-Iranians, because my experience inside of American prison was so many of the people who are in their prisons, Americans themselves, that should not be there. And they have no voice to speak out for them. And I think that that saddens me the most, um, because we call ourselves the voice of the voiceless, and hopefully we are. But there's so many others that really still don't have a voice, and we have to bring attention to the abuse that is taking place there. I agree with you. Media did play a ver very big role on this, and uh, obviously Press TV was part of that, but it was um, quite incredible to uh, get the type of reaction uh, that your arrest did play at the time. Uh, obviously, the situation was very tense. Now, um, Dr. Soleimani, let me also uh, ask you about what you experienced, which was somewhat similar in terms of uh, an arrest that was made based on uh, nothing that you did that uh, showed that you had broken the law. It's been, uh, not a year, but it's been a number of weeks. Glad to have you here. Uh, uh, tell us how you, uh, her experience, Marzia's experience perhaps, resonates with you. But, uh, uh, I can tell you that for nothing, I did not attend any court. If you have done any wrongdoing, there should be a court session held for you, but they have just made some pretexts and they call it uh, just bypassing uh, the sanctions and they, they have a uh, problem with the Iranian science and knowledge. We have other scientists, they have faced similar pretexts and they call it bypassing the sanctions and nothing I, I, I have had I haven't done anything wrong and they knew that if they just hold a court session th th there would be nothing to say at that court session and after 14 months there was not even a single court session I was under detention I was under great deal of pressure I mean great deal of stress and in, in experiencing inhumane conditions and that's been for nothing a country that uh, claims to be adhering uh, to the law but uh, you know, when, when we hear this, uh, Dr. Short, it's, it's hard to understand, uh, first of all, trying to find the uh, reasoning behind this, why law was not exercised in these two cases. Break this open a little bit for us. Uh, are we looking at the legal side of things? Are we looking at a political tussle, perhaps, that exists between uh, the two countries, which uh, has re reached crisis point, as you're well aware? Uh, I think it's uh, the latter. I should say the former versus the latter. If you you think about the fact that you can have the assassination of two persons who are not fighting against the United States during a diplomatic mission, as well as bellicosity in terms of how one nation speaking to another would had which had just 
worked with Iran and allies to deal with the situation in, in Syria, that you, you see that there are persons who are hawkish, they want a conflict with the Islamic Republic and its friends in the region, and they're attacking individuals. It's sort of uh, like a sugar substitute, a political substitute, instead of going after uh, a, a, a person in the, uh, in the army or in the political system of Iran, you will get an, an academic or a media person. At the same time, people make that argument that persons who are non-combatants find themselves in trouble in Iran. So we've got a, a very, very unbalanced and hawkish diplomatic, if I can call it diplomatic, relationship that plays out in microaggressive actions, oftentimes against individual citizens. Well, Marzia, uh, the questions I'm sure come to your mind about the way that you fit some kind of profile that maybe uh, sets something off for them to try to detain you. Um, at the same time, um, you, uh, you talked about, uh, and I'm going to quote you, mm -hmm. uh, about the statement that I'd like for you to expand on a little bit more for us. You said, just as America is aware of the harassment of the black community by the police, America needs to start talking about the harassment of the Muslim community by the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm forging those two together to, right. to get a reaction from you here. Definitely, that is the case we have seen, especially post 9 11 um, in the United States, the, uh, the type of pressure that have been on Muslims. Um, and uh, of course, when we're talking about Muslims from certain places, even worse. The type of Muslims we're talking about, the Muslims who stand up for their rights, Muslims who um, uh, believe in um, not accepting. Uh, oppression, at, at least uh, standing up for it. So um, for me, you know, it's interesting what you've just said uh, when you were talking to Dr. Short, uh, because uh, what he said, instead of uh, dealing with military individuals or whatever, dealing with journalists, dealing with scientists, and it was so true. I mean, it, it was many times when they were talking to me and they were questioning me, and I'm thinking, why are they asking me this question? I'm not a politician in the Islamic Republic. I, I don't have any responsibility as far as decision making in the political s s sector. So why would they be asking me? You know, I, I really, because I've thought about it a lot uh, over the year, um, the main reason I feel behind this was and is intimidation. It is this battle between the United States against Iran and uh, they will make an example out of, uh, I feel, anyone who plays a role somehow, in whatever little way, whatever, in the Islamic Republic. In my case, I think it was intimidation for those who want to stand up and speak about the Islamic Republic, talk about Iran, whether it's on social media or other forms, uh, making an example that you're going to pay a price. If you do this, you're going to pay a price. Uh, if you <coughs> progress scientifically, either you do it in the name of the United States, or if you want to do it in the name of Iran, you're going to pay a price. And I think that they raise up the price so much that a lot of people just cave in. It's like, okay, fine, whatever. Yeah, we'll be there. We'll, we'll do it over there. We won't say, we won't speak up um, for Iran. And for those of us who have, there's a price to be paid. Yeah, obviously, and you're a journalist in, the, in that respect. Journalist, so and I'm American, uh, you know, so, but it, it didn't matter when they were putting on the shackles and when they were handcuffing me. It didn't matter that I was American. It didn't matter that I have a right, allegedly, according to the U.S. Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. It does not matter. Dr. Soleimani, uh, you talked about how the... Uh, profession that you're involved in and the level of uh, expertise overall that you reached in your profession uh, perhaps is something that the U.S. looks down upon or wants to prevent uh, for an Iranian to progress as much as you did in your field. Mind you, the accomplishments that uh, you achieved are not only noteworthy, but they helped 
and do help with the progression of uh, of humankind uh, in the medical field. I'm uh, just you know, talking generally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why do you think the U.S. would would look at uh, you or an Iranian and want to prevent that from happening? بله ببینید اصلا کشوری که مایکل کاسپیتال خودش من دعوت کرده بود برای کار ریسرچ well i was uh, invited by my clinic hospital for research work and that's been due to my cv i received multiple visa j1 and upon uh, my arrival they said that your visa has been revoked while you you were on air and I worked in the field of stem cell. They pursued several objectives. They wanted to make us slow down and because in various fields of therapies we had made considerable progress and we had joined activities with uh, I had joined activities with my colleagues at uh, Shahada Hospital and we published the outcome of our researchers in a, in a scientific journal and we had cell therapy activities and we had it in new surgery journal and we were doing the, the phase number three and when I was detained uh, I told them that I had, I had to take care of my patients and they said that has nothing to do with us and they did not care about the patients and, and they said it doesn't matter for us and they paid no attention to the condition of the patients and, and I've come to the conclusion that they wanted to somehow hamper our progress there was that hearing at the court there was only a single hearing session at the court and my attorney uh, introduced me to, 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 and he said that I was among uh, the top 100 scientists and that I worked on uh, severe diseases and that um, uh, I just wanted to serve humanity and they said that if in your patients if they die it doesn't matter and we don't care and it was really a surprise for me when my uh, attorney was telling them that he is a scientist working that I worked as a scientist and the majority of my papers uh, uh, there were over 400 500 citations in those papers and my attorneys told them that when other scientists referred to these papers that means that uh, the activities have been monitored and that such activities can be helpful for curing many diseases but they just wanted to impede our progress so what would have happened if, uh, with my detention? I just wanted to serve humanity and serve my patients. And they wanted to just eliminate all these because what they they, they had made some allegations, they made certain claims, and they had no proofs or documents. And eventually I was acquitted, but and they said that I was innocent, so I was held in, de de under de in detention for 14 months so this indicates that their enmity also has a scientific nature they are hostile towards our scientific progress and when they see that we are making progress in scientific fields and serving humanity and the patients uh, they, they, they cannot even tolerate this they want to just hamper our scientific progress and that's all I could just that's the only conclusion I could draw within 14 months. It's it's an open hostility. It's an hus they are hostile towards our scientific progress. They want to hamper our progress in, her, in order to prevent our uh, progress in the field of medicine for curing uh, patients because many of these papers were published for the first time in the world and uh, they, they have been published in most American great. journals. Uh, very alarming though some of the things you're saying. Dr. Short, I mean it, you know, uh, this in a sense makes uh, the U.S. look uh, and appear like a monster, especially in terms of uh, the lack of uh, 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 the lack that they have for, for care of, of human lives as, uh, as, our, um, as our guests here indicated. Uh, but at the same time, I'd like to ask you what you think about what was just said, 
by Dr. Soleimani, but at the same time, we have Iranians, or the U.S. has Iranians within the U.S. that have advanced in many different fields, um, whether it's scientific, whether it's entrepreneurial, uh, and what have you. Uh, I mean, is, is the outlook on Iranians that negative by, by the U.S., and is, is it particular to this administration? I don't think it's particular to this administration or to the administrations of other countries that are hostile to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, it's no secret that scientists are assassinated, are targeted, and, and have been killed by secret service or intelligence persons or assets or fifth columnists have killed. Iranian scientists in Iran, in particular in the area of uh, avionics, uh, uh, nuclear power, physics, there is a desire for Iran to remain, or not so much remain, but to be behind other countries. Let's just cut to the quick of this. There is an unfair allocation of wealth and power in the world and what has allowed that system to remain in place is that the lethality the firepower the science used in terms of waging war on other people has been in the hands of nations that take things like oil gas gold minerals whatever and those countries that produce these are not able to enjoy or benefit or be compensated fairly. And so there's great fear amongst nations that have a historic, predatory, Draculean relationship with countries whose, again, petrochemicals, the oil, the gas, and other things, uh, they haven't been paid for. If certain countries had the capacity to take a life for a life, whether defensively or offensively, has to be frightening to uh, countries or entities or corporations that are used to a neo-colonial vampirian relationship with uh, primary producers of minerals, energy, and other resources. Having said that, um, NASA has a significant number of Iranian persons working for the space program and the space industry in the United States. The National Institute of Health has a significant number of Iranians and other foreign nationals. So as long as it benefits a specific set of countries, certain sorts of scientific inquiry, invention, and innovation is wanted if it's in a society that is not favored by the, how could I say, exploitative powers, they are hindered. For example, 20 years ago, the Cubans found vaccines for meningitis. You will never find the Cuban medication available for sale in many countries. And there's a great fear by pharmaceutical corporations that uh, whether it's nuclear medicine and other innovations that are occurring in Iran, that these would be not only competitive with Western-made medications, generic and otherwise, but superior and at a better, lower, non-predatory uh, capitalistic price, mm -hmm. that spells doom to some of the more profitable corporations in the uh, the Anglo-American uh, conglomerate of nations and allies. Okay. Uh, while I was listening to Dr. Short there, Marzi, I was looking at uh, the images that were being played right next to him, and it brings back memories um, of, uh, of those times uh, while you were in detainment. Um, I can't help but to uh, uh, think of the impact that that had on the general public, on Iranians, on media personnel, and just uh, people around the world when they, when they witnessed that. So tell us some of the positive things that came out of the harsh ordeal that you went through. Hmm. Well, I think uh, 
one of the most positive aspects was the uh, social media movement. And we saw that uh, it can be very effective and we can connect globally. Um, also, I think Press TV itself, Press TV in taking the lead. Um, of course, this is after the fact that I looked at it. I, I didn't know what was going on at the time. Um, that uh, stations all over were tuning in to press. Press was the one that it was actually um, giving the first-hand news. And I think that that's, that's a great example for what we can do, the possibilities, and, and what we should be doing in, in many um, situations. Um, I think it's the, it was the camaraderie that, that people came together all over the world um, to stand up against oppression. You know, the demonstration uh, that we had, um, that I wanted to have even after I had gotten out because they had already set it up. While you were in the States, right? While, while I was about. in the States. I was released and um, I was told that they had already set up that Friday for a demonstration all over the world <coughs> for this. And I wanted to make sure that we kept that day. And, and the reason why I stayed there and in Washington, D.C., I did okay. that because it wasn't, uh, my point was this, it's not about Marzia Hashimi. Okay. It's about this I'm going to ask you just uh, quickly, we're going to okay. go for a short break. Okay. Hold on to your thoughts. Sure. Uh, we'll go for this break, and we'll come right back to this uh, special program. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. This is a special uh, program that we're having to mark the one-year anniversary uh, since uh, the detainment and release of uh, Marzi Hashimi, a press TV um, news anchor, documentary filmmaker, who's in the studio with us to talk about uh, what has transpired. And also we have um, Dr. Masoud Soleimani, Iranian stem cell scientist, who's with us, and Dr. Randy Short, civil rights activist. Okay, so uh, before the break, uh, you were talking, I forget the line of thought that you had. If you remember, please continue. 
Okay, that's that's a tough question. That's a tough one. That's what I usually throw at people. Uh, if all right, I no problem. And now you're throwing it at me, but um, I think what we were talking the about media, uh, the media, the positive aspects and, and everything of, of 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 it all. And I was just talking about the solidarity um, that we saw from all over the world. Um, it was uh, quite amazing for me when I got out. I had no idea what had taken place, and I saw. You know the video, whether it was from um, the people in Iran or the states or Kashmir or Nigeria, just so many places, and that it had taken off in the way um, that it did. A and I can tell you that they were also um, the judge, the lawyers. They were quite surprised and taken aback by it all too, and because in the very beginning, when they um, uh, when they arrested me and uh, when they communicated with my kids. They said, make sure that no one finds out about this. Make sure you don't talk about this. Um, that's what they had told them. That's what they told me. And when I got my, the first time I got my two minute call, <coughs> two or three minute call, I mean, that's the first thing that I told my daughter. Make sure you make a lot of noise. Make sure you make a lot of noise. Uh, because, of that. course, they told me not to make noise, which actually <coughs> meant the opposite. I mean, I, I kind of learned that from, um, the leader, actually, of the revolution, Imam Khomeini, a long time ago, when talking about when dealing with the U.S. and how to deal with him. And I used that, and um, I, I didn't listen, and it was very effective, because I have a feeling that it could have been a lot longer had um, I not gotten that media attention. Well, Dr. Soleimani, you, uh, uh, in a sense, also had uh, the media get in on this, uh, well, press to be, obviously, um, and after that started to snowball, in terms of the um, uh, recognition given to the to your story and your ordeal, uh, you then had uh, uh, the participation of the government in some sense. Um, I remember the Iranian foreign minister uh, with you by the plane, and that was a very uh, touching moment. Uh, t tell us uh, about that experience, that the, the particular participation of the Iranian government when it came to your case. Obviously, w a worthy case, to say the least. Mm -hmm. من می توانم که ببینید وقتی که یه جا میڈیا فعال میشه I can tell you that when the media become active that will have a very good impact on both sides and when the media became active that also accelerated the activities by the government and of course uh, great deal of efforts were made by the foreign ministry and also uh, the security bodies and uh, also the judiciary they all made efforts and I have to thank them all uh, and I can tell you that the media can play a crucial role and the media played a positive role and Nature also uh, issued a paper, part, an article asking, uh, just published an article questioning the reason behind my detention and then the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Times, they, they all uh, said that how come he's not indicted and if he has committed no crime then he should be released. So. The media played an extraordinary role, and the government also made great deal of efforts, and and a great deal of efforts was made by the Iranian side, and that was quite helpful. And I, as a, as an Iranian citizen, I have to do what I can for my country, but. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the programs broadcast by Press TV, I was informed about them by my attorney, and the Press TV programs had a great deal of feedback, and I was told about the feedback, and the Iranians there uh, contacted uh, my attorney, and uh, 
کاری که پرس تیوی کرده also the, the, the Iranian associations uh, they, they have become also active due to the programs broadcast by press TV and even the judge the prosecutor they came under pressure uh, and there was and that the public had become aware they knew that the public had become aware of this and they were questioned uh, and they said that if I, I've committed no crime then I should have been released earlier so uh, allow me to thank press TV and dr. Jebeli and also Ms. Hashemi for uh, their hard work and I can tell you that the media played a crucial role and in showed that the media's involvement can be crucial. There are several colleagues there. They are also facing similar problems that can be, such activities can be helpful for contributing to the release. And and the American has, are quite hostile with respect to our scientific progress. What he was just saying, and I think that we have to um, remember that, that um, when they, <coughs> uh, because this happens to a lot of people, they usually try to intimidate once they arrest you. Um, and, and especially with the, someone coming from uh, another place, because they know the importance of the media. So they tell those individuals, you know, you don't talk, you make sure that the media does not find out about this. And because people are in situations, they feel compromised, they don't know exactly what to do, they're afraid. They're afraid. They, they've never been, I, I know neither one of us have ever been in jail um, before. It's a very um, intimidating situation. And, and of course the families then are afraid. Well, they told us not to do it, so I guess we better not do it. And believe me, I think, uh, with Dr. Soleimani, because in the very beginning, we did not know, the media did not know about it, because actually they had told his family also not to take it to the media. And, and this is what happens with a lot of people. And I really believe that people, especially when you're innocent and you know you haven't done anything wrong, it's your right and you should. You should make your voice heard. And so others can hear it and, and, and try to put pressure on that government. Sure. Well, Dr. Short, I mean, uh, the, the thing that runs through my mind here is uh, how Iran has been demonized so often, um, especially with this uh, particular administration in which Donald Trump has something, it seems, uh, it, against it Muslims. I, I, I can talk about that example about the Muslim uh, majority ban on those uh, seven, seven countries. But um, uh, Dr. Soleimani talked about how the Iranians there uh, opened their eyes and were pursuing and actively following his case. Um, do you think that Americans as a whole, uh, this has had an impact, Marzia's case, Dr. Soleimani's case, and perhaps they now can see uh, maybe Iran in a different light than what has been fed to them? I don't think that Iran's going to be seen in a different light because of these cases for most people. I think for the minority of people that are willing to open their eyes it was an alert for some, but this didn't start with Trump. There's a long-standing animosity towards people, uh, especially if they're perceived to not be in the, the A crowd, the good crowd, the right racial grouping, which Iranians, I, I think you're white, but they don't. Certain people, if you're not in the superior race, the ubermensch, you get untermenschen treatment, okay? That's consistent. That didn't start with Donald Trump. Jimmy Carter was in office decades before Donald Trump ever got elected. And uh, Eisenhower was president with the first CIA coup against Mohammed Mossadegh. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt either was president or, or, or before, or just after he was president, the British decided to steal the oil in Iran in 1908. So this is a 100 and, and, and 12 year or longer process of demonizing or ripping off or cheating people in Iran. It didn't just start. So with all due respect, this is a continuation and it's done differently by different administrations depending on 
what the circumstance is. You have two key things. You have the creation of the nation of Israel in 1948. So like what, what 31 years after Israel was created, you had the Islamic revolution. You have these two historic events that deeply influence uh, America's policy towards Iran. And it's a continual demonization because of oil, because of power, because of uh, eschatological, philosophical, religious views held by many people. This contributes to what's going on. Well, Marzia, um, we need to expand a little bit more on this uh, because uh, based on just reports that I that I read, that I'm sure you have also read, and uh, just throughout the time that Trump has come into office, uh, we're looking at, for example, this most recent report that uh, came out just uh, a <coughs> little less than 24 hours ago, the ongoing harassment and mistreatment of Iranian students. It talks about how uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, border protection is harassing them um, uh, when they come to want to enter. These are students with uh, valid visas to enter uh, the U.S. They get detained, they get questioned, and it's, uh, the numbers are excessive and it's harsher and right. more severe than before. Mm -hmm. So the natural deduction is, is this particular U.S. administration stemming from the White House and that president who has started this type of uh, approach towards Iranians, I, I, I guess. Well, let me say, um, um, I understand what your premise is. Um, I have to say, with uh, Donald Trump, he, yes, he's more in your face with it. Um, of course, you know, I go back to... 1979 and I can come from that time and I look at the various administration um, whether Democrat or Republican the reality is is that Iran which uh, we're facing uh, we're getting close to the 41st anniversary of the Islamic Revolution in a couple of weeks and I think that from day one from that time that we have seen pressure on Iran and on Iranians in different ways in different ways depending on the administration but that pressure has always been there I mean the sanctions that we're looking at sanctions have been there I mean even um, we, we try to compare sometimes the Obama administration to the Trump administration um, but we see that under Obama sanctions were also increased against Iran uh, the difference is, is that Donald Trump is uh, if you want to say rougher around the edges he's not that smooth with uh, his speech um, and so uh, there are some of us who believe it, uh, that with a Donald Trump, uh, he is the reality of the face of the United States. The difference is, uh, and sometimes that makes it easier to deal with, no matter how difficult he can be. It makes it easier because you know what you're dealing with. Under an administration like an Obama administration, well, it's smiling, you know, it's an administration that's smiling in your face and it's speaking Farsi to you um, for Noruz, for New Year, um, and stabbing you at the back at the same time. So we have to understand, yes, right now, um, uh, with the whole situation that is happening in the region, after the terrorist attack by the United States against General Soleimani and of course Iran's response on the military base that no other country had ever dared to do attack an American military base the United States did not attack Iran after that which they would have always attacked another country if they had done that they couldn't do that so they may harass some Iranian students um, coming in the border or coming from a concert or whatever temporarily um, but I think we have to look at the bigger picture that animosity in general um, against Iran that has been well, as Dr. Schwartz said he took it back to um, the early 20th century but for sure from 1979 beyond because if Iran says Iran wants to control its natural resources its human resources it's it wants to be able to do research or, or whatever in the name of its own people in the name of its own country and then if you're dealing with an entity uh, a country that does not allow that. Yes, it's true, as Dr. Schwartz said, and you mentioned that Iranians, we have many Iranians, for example, in NASA and uh, in other um, places in the United States who, who obviously are making a lot of contributions. But remember, the contributions they're making are made in the name of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's they a are point. not allowed to say, for example, they have whatever, they've patented something, they've come up with something, they've created something, whatever. It is this scientist, doctor, whomever, 
from the United States. That's the difference. Well, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, <laughs> I, w I want to make sure, um, uh, Dr. Soleimani, that um, an outsider who's maybe watching this, uh, in particular uh, an American, uh, what they can uh, uh, take out of this uh, when they hear a case like yours. Um, I mean, both have uh, obviously unique characteristics, Marzia's case and your case, but you're a, you're a doctor and you're renowned in your field, the advancements that you've made, the contributions that you've made. An American looking at your case, what would you want them to take away? Or maybe I should uh, say, what would you like to tell them um, regarding yourself, or regarding your case, so that uh, they can get an idea and a sense of uh, what has occurred here? <laughs> ببین من به نظر من که خب دولت آمریکا سعی میکنه اون چهره صهیونیستی و نجات پرستی شو administration seeks to hide its uh, racist and Zionist face behind such certain commercial or economic activities. Some uh, believe that the U.S. is a utopia, but uh, in fact, the real and the true image of the United States eventually becomes clear to everyone. So, the colleagues who are there, the Iranians who are there, particularly the students, they should pay close attention to this point. The Americans are not our friends, they are truly our enemy. And they engage in hostility, and I emphasize that they are more hostile with respect to scientific issues and I have re realized this myself during 14 months of my detention and uh, recently uh, a student of economics I just heard it in the news today that uh, the Americans wanted to deport an Iranian student of economics and so you see they, they want to deprive our students from studying and they uh, used to say that they should be deprived of uh, studying nuclear physics and now they have moved on to other fields even economics and they want to deprive Iranian students of uh, studying and t in today's world whoever has uh, a better knowledge he can uh, attain a better status in the world and they know this very well and that's why uh, they are hostile and they want to prevent Iran's progress. They used to talk about weapons uh, in the past, but in today's world, what matters is scientific advancement and progress. And that's, that's what I want to just recommend to Iranian students and researchers who are there. They, they should pay attention to s uh, such an issue. And the Americans make use of baseless allegations and pretext for putting pressure on them, on the students, and, and we shouldn't get tired, and we should keep up our work, either inside the country or outside. In other words, science does not belong to any particular place, but the Americans are making use of this as a tool they are. They have a politically motivated approach, and they have a politically motivated approach towards other countries, particularly countries uh, that want to uh, make progress so they are facing American opposition and the Americans uh, are bothering them in order to hamper their progress. Well, Dr. Short, you heard uh, Dr. Soleimani there. Uh, so one of the takeaways from this is that the U.S. is going to uh, uh, miss out on uh, some of the talent that exists out there. Um, of course, Iran is politicized in terms of uh, uh, obviously what's involved with Iran. Uh, do you think that Trump's America First policy and its pushback against Im immigrants coming into the country, Iranians being one of those countries, is going to n not help uh, uh, the U.S. In, in a variety of fields, in a different uh, fields? Um, our, our, our guest here, Dr. Solomon, mentioned that uh, an Iranian um, economist was uh, now being targeted. Th doesn't the U.S. lose out uh, when it comes down to this? I'm going to answer that differently from what you expect. The United States misses out on 
ignoring what roughly 100 million people within its borders, at least half of them black, who don't get to make the kind of contributions that they should be able to make due to systemic, structural, uh, financial, and other types of racisms and injustice. Um, so just starting at home, if you don't have charity at home, people shouldn't be shocked that there isn't charity abroad. It's one. In terms of true immigration, like the gentleman that was the economist that went through the process to come into the country, I do think that that's a loss when you have talented, gifted people who are willing to come to the United States to make a contribution, having gone through the legal process of applying and doing the paperwork. I think that that is uh, gro grossly unfortunate for everyone. However, for people who come into the country unlawfully, uh, and we have them in the millions who commit crimes, they're in all colors, I completely support the president that in, in order to have sovereignty, you have to have borders and you have to have a reasonable immigration policy that favors the naturalized or native population first. Uh, with that caveat, as a descendant of people who immigrated to this country from the Caribbean, uh, if you come through the doors properly, your color, your creed, your background shouldn't be held against you. Uh, so that's how I'd answer that. But the other thing that I, I would say that I get from what he said, and, and I'm going to go to the Holy Scriptures of the Bible. The Bible tells us, as you sow, so shall you also reap. If a nation sows the seeds of peace, love, understanding, fair commerce, and, 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 and mutuality, you'll reap that. If you sow hatred, division, imperialism, neocolonialism, racism, Islamophobia, whatever, you will reap that as well. I'm not convinced that the ruling elite have an understanding that the word of God applies to them just like it does to me. Mm -hmm. And my scripture says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess who God is. That includes rich billionaires, irrespective of whether they're right, center, or left, that do not understand that the wealth and the fullness of the earth belongs to God that's to be shared by everyone. Mm -hmm. Those who don't understand that will find themselves in burning hell. Okay, my final question to you, Maricia. Uh There was something that uh, we touched on that you said, asked me towards the end of the program. Mm. And my question to you is, uh, after the ordeal that you went through, how do you view the U.S., given what we talked about, that you did not go for, you're here, and you're representing, obviously, a whole a lot of people who share similar thoughts as you have? Right. Of course, you know, I have a, a different background, being a black American to begin with, and had been an activist many years in the United States. I, I, I knew a lot of things very well. Um, however, after this ordeal, and after seeing the way that they can um, treat an individual and totally ignore any rights, um, um, just like with Dr. Soleimani, I mean, they told me that I wasn't being charged with the crime, and yet they shackled me, they, they um, handcuffed me, they kidnapped me because they took me out of an airport and took me to a different city. Um, uh, they would not let me keep my hijab. All of these things that they say, that they believe in these human rights, and they go into countries all over the world talking about helping them with their human rights, and we see that right there at home, they don't abide by it. And at the same time, what they told me at the end, I will tell you, they said, they told me at the end, they said, we will give you anything you want. We will give you anything you want, including if you want a new identity. We'll give you whatever you want. Stay here. Basically, work for them, which basically means working against Iran in that case, and we'll take care of you. They believe that everyone can be bought. 
And I think that that got to me more than anything out of all of the lies and the creation of everything that they had done and going against my rights and, and, and just the, the lack of respect. Yeah, and let me just say, the whole price process is a very dehumanizing process. The jail cells there, you know, as soon as you walk in, there's a toilet facing outside. Um, that that guards men and women that are passing there. It's a dehumanizing process every step of the way. And then at the end, when they told me that, uh, I was very upset, you know, because they really believe everything comes down to money. They believe that everyone can be bought. They do not understand that there are people that have values um, that believe in something much higher than money can buy. And that is what is right. Believing in what is right and trying to do what is right. You know, we have pluses and minuses. We have problems here in Iran like, like any other country, okay? But the difference is that the United States is the hegemon. And they are trying to impose their will on everyone. You either go their way or they will destroy you. Or they will try their best to destroy you. And yes, I stand against that, and will always stand against that. We will end it on that. Thank you so much, uh, Mazi Hashemi, uh, for sharing your experience sure. uh, after this uh, year, marking uh, the anniversary of uh, your release. We're gl again, we're glad that you're here. Me too. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Masoud Soleimani, Iranian stem cell scientist. It was a pleasure. It was my first time meeting you, so it was a pleasure to meet you. And thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. And Dr. Randy Short, thank you civil rights activist from Washington, D.C. And thank you for joining us in this uh, special program. Send us your thoughts, your comments. Newsroom at PressTV.ir is our email address. Just goodbye from me. Kavit Akhwe. Murderer are killing kids on a school bus in yeah. Yemen. Since Saudi Arabia launched its deadly airstrikes on the people of Yemen, which has led to over 9,400 uh, Yemenis being killed, including 4,000 women and children. How can a regime which calls its military the most humane uh, in the world continually inflict so much death and injury to even young people and children? <laughs> Yeah! <laughs>